Hi everyone, in this video we're going to go over the basic histology of muscle tissues. So just like with every other tissue that you've met so far, uh, one of the first things that you'll notice is that there are more than just one type of muscle. So we have three different types of muscle in this case to look at. And so they are subdivided into skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Now the classification is based mostly on the appearance of striations, so the first two are striated muscle okay, so these are striated because they have uh, what are known as striations uh, due to the arrangement of myofilaments within these muscle fibers or within these muscle types Okay, so the as you might know, we have um, myofilaments arranged into sarcomeres, and so that's the typical thing that you learn about about muscle is that you have sarcomeres and you have myosin and actin arranged in a particular way, and that tends to happen in skeletal and cardiac muscle. But these myofilaments are arranged a little bit differently in smooth muscle, and so smooth muscle actually doesn't have a striated appearance. That's why it's called smooth, um, because the actual filaments are arranged differently. Okay, so they don't have that same uh, sarcomere sort of arrangement. Okay, so let's take a look at them individually now. So first of all, skeletal muscle. Uh, it's probably what most of us think of as muscle tissues. So we're going to start with this one. Now, skeletal muscle is classified as skeletal because it is attached to the skeleton, to the skeletal system. However, histologically, um, there's also a, a type of muscle that looks the same, which is the visceral striated muscle, like for example, the tongue. So the tongue is not attached to the skeleton, but histologically it looks very similar to skeletal muscle. Okay, and so I'm just putting them all together into this one category, but technically tongue is not a skeletal muscle, but instead it's a striated, a visceral striated muscle. Okay. Now the characteristics of this tissue is that it is highly vascularized. Um, there's a lot of capillary beds passing through this muscle uh, and it is associated with connective tissue so you know that muscle is connected to tendons um, and the tendons are then attached to bones and that's what allows you to move and so the tendons aren't just attached to the very ends of the muscle you actually have connective tissue um, found throughout the actual muscle tissue itself now the muscle itself also has some regenerative capacity so you do have um, specific uh, stem cells called satellite cells now this is not a specific term for stem cells here it's just a general term for cells that are nearby to other cells okay so skeletal muscle satellite cells are stem cells which are able to help with the production of new muscle fibers at least in young individuals they can help to produce new muscle fibers um, and so production of new muscle fibers of new fibers or cells as you might better know them as is known as hyperplasia Uh, however, these satellite cells um, tend to also be involved in repair. Okay. Uh, especially in adults, uh, where we're no longer uh, producing new cells. Um, pretty much all muscle growth at that point tends to happen through hypertrophy, which is the increase in size of a cell. So that's basically satellite cells would uh, fuse with damaged cells and that would help to produce an increase in the size of the cell uh, that had been damaged simply because you have more of these satellite cells fusing with it, generating a larger cell in the end. Okay. So that's the tissue itself. 
let's take a look at the cells. Uh, so skeletal muscle cells are non-mitotic. Uh, partially that's because they are multinucleated. Okay, so if you are multinucleated cells, how would you do mitosis exactly? That's just not possible. Also, they are completely filled with protein. So you can see that um, in this image, uh, we have a lot of eosinophilic staining, and that's because the cells are just completely filled with protein. As you can see in this diagram, you have these structures. These are myofibrils. Okay, so the roots are composed of many, many, many myofilaments. Uh, and so you have the cells just completely filled with this material, with this protein. There's barely any space in that cell for other organelles, which is why the nuclei are eccentric. They're pushed off to the sides. And again, because we have these skeletal muscle fi fibers forming from the fusion of multiple cells, um, they are multinucleated. And so again, as you have repair happening, more satellite cells are fused to a, a damaged skeletal muscle fiber, and so uh, this becomes having even more nuclei. Uh, as I, I keep referring to them as muscle fibers because they are really no longer cells. These are quite long. Uh, they can be one to two centimeters in length, so these cells are actually quite, quite long. Okay. Now in this image what you're seeing, I mean if you switch colors, so hopefully it'll be a little bit easier to see. I'm going to outline the uh, ends of one of these fibers. So here's one side. The muscle fibers are running up and down in this image from top to bottom. And so what I'm drawing here is the edges of one of these cells. Okay, so that's roughly where the edges are. And so from here to here, is the thickness of one cell okay so um, this is how thick it is and so some of these nuclei that you're seeing around the outside would belong to this muscle fiber okay so you have some of these nuclei out here forming part of this muscle fiber here so you can see that these are multinucleated cells and again the cell itself is completely filled with uh, with protein. Now one of the things that you will see, one of the reasons I'm using this image is that you can actually see the striations here. And so the myofibrils, so let me just draw the myofibrils, so a single myofibril, maybe I'll use a, a different marker. A single myofibril would go from one end of the cell all the way down to the other end of the cell. We don't have the full length of the cell even visible on this slide right now. And so the striations actually go across. Okay, so the striations are going across this thing. So that's what you're seeing here. Are these light and dark bands. And because a lot of these myofibrils are so tightly packed together, you can actually see these striations going all the way across the whole thickness of the cell. Okay. Now I'm going to um, duplicate this slide and erase the notes on this one because I want to show you something else here. I'm going to try to zoom in. So if you look carefully at the edges of this cell here, right there we see this kind of a wavy appearance, a bit of a fiber around the outside of this cell. Here's another little bit of fibrous material at the edge of the cell. What we're looking at here is collagen. So we're looking at connective tissue that is associated with each individual muscle fiber. Okay, so each fiber is surrounded by some connective tissue uh, and that becomes continuous later on with the tendon itself.
Okay, so in this way, each fiber is able to pull against a tendon uh, along its full length. Okay, let me just zoom back out again. Now, skeletal muscle is organized in a very particular um, hierarchy. So you initially start out with this individual muscle fiber, okay? So or muscle cell, a myocyte, which is surrounded by a little bit of connective tissue. That connective tissue is referred to as an endomycium. You've seen endo before. It refers to the inside of something. Okay, so mycium refers to muscle. Okay, so on the inside of the muscle, you have connective tissue. That connective tissue is called the endomycium, and it surrounds individual muscle fibers. So that's connective tissue. Okay. Now the muscle fibers themselves are organized into small bundles. Okay, so you can have multiple muscle fibers producing one larger sort of structure, which is referred to as a fascicle. Okay. So these bundles are called fascicles. So that's several muscle cells together make up a fascicle. And that fascicle is surrounded by more connective tissue, which is referred to as a perimysium. Again, you've seen peri before. Okay, that's something that surrounds the perimeter of something. So something that's so surrounding something. That's perimysium. Okay. And then the fascicles themselves are again organized into a larger structure and that larger structure is called a muscle okay so a muscle is composed of multiple fascicles and that muscle like for example a biceps muscle uh, would be surrounded by more connective tissue a thicker layer of connective tissue which is referred to as an epimysium and you have also seen epi as an epithelium so epimysium epi means upon or on the surface of something. Okay. <clears throat> so the epi refers to the outermost layer of connective tissue around the muscle. Uh, perimysium refers to the connective tissue layer that is surrounding individual fascicles. And then the endomysium is found within the muscle uh, and is going to be found surrounding each and individual muscle fiber or muscle cell. Okay, so let's take a look at this, what it looks like in practical terms. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what you're seeing here is a very high magnification image of a single muscle cell or muscle fiber in cross section. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a cross section. And let me just try to get my bearings here. Figure out where my pointer is. So right around here, I'm trying to outline one single cell. Okay. Now you'll notice that the cell itself is filled with a very eosinophilic material. This is protein. You're seeing a cross section through this muscle fiber, so you're seeing a cross section through the myofibrils as well. Okay, so you're seeing these little small eosinophilic dots. just finished drawing the outline of this. So all these little dots that you're seeing in here, all these little dots that you're seeing in here are cross sections through the myofibrils. Okay? Now, um, as you can see, the outline is in yellow, and so everything around that outline is going to be a little bit of connective tissue. So let me just, let me just erase this so you can see it for yourself. So right around, okay, let me just find my cursor on this image, there it is, so right here, right in this area is where the endomysium is, 
Okay. In fact, if you look carefully, you can actually see that this endomycium contains some blood vessels. So here's a capillary right here. That's one capillary. And there's another one. It's difficult to find my... Right here. Another capillary. Okay, so we have a couple of capillaries there. And again, if you look carefully, you'll notice that there's a nuclei visible here. Um, these nuclei are at the edges of the cell. There's one right here. There's another nucleus right here. Clearly belonging to the cell that I was just outlining earlier. Okay, so again, we have a multi included cell. Uh, which has a little bit of connective tissue around it, that's the endomycium. Okay? Now if we zoom out of this, uh, we're going to take a look at this at much lower magnification. So here we are, we're looking at uh, 400x this time. And so again, I'm going to just take yellow color and try to outline one of these cells for you. That's a rough outline here can kind of make out the edges of the cell here. Okay, so that's one cell. Again, we're still looking at cross-section here. Okay, uh, again, this one cell would have a multiple nuclei associated with it. Um, also, I'd like to point out um, all the capillaries here. So again, the capillaries that you're seeing here would all be found in this case within the endomycium. Okay, uh, so this is the endomycium is going to make an attachment or provide an attachment point for the cells with the connective tissue, but also I think that was a capillary but it will also provide vascularization. So there will be capillaries found within this region that would feed all these cells. Okay. Now, when we get into the larger structures, when we look at the perimycium and the epimycium, you would see larger and larger blood vessels that would actually feed these capillaries. Okay. So let's zoom out to look at the, the same structure from a high magnification, oh, sorry, lower magnification, and so here, for example, is one of these fascicles. So here's a fascicle. And so the region that I'm aligning in yellow is where you would find the perimycium. Okay? And so you can kind of see this region right here is looking very broken up. Uh, basically, it's a loose connective tissue. And so during slide preparation, during sectioning, uh, it just got broken up because of just how uh, weak and loose that type of connective tissue there is. Uh, and right here, we have an example of another blood vessel. This one's a little bit larger. And so this is one of the arterioles, most likely, that would be feeding the capillaries that would be found within the and this uh, fascicle within the endomycium that feeds all these different cells. Okay? So, I don't have a, a lower magnification than this, unfortunately, so I can't really show you the epimycium in this case, but basically a whole bunch of these fascicles, you can see individual fascicles again. Uh, right here is another fascicle. Here's another fascicle. Okay, so each one of these will be surrounded by a bit of connective tissue that would be referred to as a perimycium. And again, all together, all these fascicles that you're seeing here would make up one large muscle. And that muscle would be surrounded by an epimycium. Okay? So let's move on to the next type of muscle, which is cardiac muscle. Okay? And so cardiac muscle is found really one place in the heart. Okay? That's why it's called cardiac muscle. Uh, again, it's a specialized kind of muscle. Um, it's very highly vascularized. Um, so you can actually see in this diagram here is a capillary. 
Now these capillaries are absolutely critical to the functioning of this muscle uh, because they're going to be bringing a lot of oxygen. Okay, the cardiac muscle cells cannot live without any oxygen. Uh, in fact, if you cut off the blood supply to the region and you don't restore it within about 20 minutes or so, the actual cardiomyocytes will start to die out. And so basically, you end up with a bunch of dead muscle fibers, and that will be replaced by connective tissue, by dense, irregular connective tissue. So the actual cardiac muscle has no regenerative capacity. Um, there is some research that shows that there seems to be some uh, satellite cells present within cardiac muscle, but there's just nowhere near enough regenerative capacity to be able to repair damage after a heart attack. Okay, so again, be good to your heart because you're not going to get any more muscle fibers there. So take good care of them. Okay. Now the muscle fibers themselves are non-mitotic again they are full of protein and so in order to do mitosis you have to break down all of that protein which you probably don't want to do uh, they are also attached to one another so they are branched uh, and attached to one another uh, because they are actually communicating with one another at all times through these junctional complexes at regions called intercalated discs uh, so these connections that are there are going to allow these cells to coordinate their contractions Okay, so they're very important, and again, mitosis would mean you have to detach all of those, which means that it would disrupt that communication as well. Now, the myocytes themselves are nowhere near as long as skeletal muscle fibers, um, but they are still relatively large. Um, and one of the big differences here is that the nuclei are round, well, at least relatively round, but more importantly, they're central. They're found within the actual cell, they're not at the periphery. And again, uh, usually you have one nucleus, but sometimes you might have two. So they're not all uninucleated. Some of them will have more than one nucleus. Now because the nucleus is central, the actual myofibrils have to separate to allow space within that cell. And so there's going to be usually a little space in, in between the myofibrils where you would have a lot of the other organelles as well. That perinuclear area uh, would have a fairly large amount of the other organelles. The other characteristic features here is that you have very large mitochondria. Okay, so cardiac muscle has very large and very abundant mitochondria. Again, these cells are very actively using up oxygen to produce lots and lots of energy and so they need to have those mitochondria present. Um, and so they are actually quite large and they are going to be found between these myofibrils which is actually going to not allow these myofibrils to be packed as tightly as they are in skeletal muscle. And so while cardiac muscle is striated, it doesn't always look that way on most slides. Okay, So it really has to be a really well-stained slide for you to be able to see the striations, and you may have to go to a very high magnification. So one of the things that you will be looking for on your slides when you're trying to identify something as cardiac muscle is looking to see if you can see branching. That's really the main thing you're going to be looking for. And so if you look at this slide here, for example, you can see some branching going on here. So this cell here is going off, branching off here. Then this cell is branching off in this direction here. Okay, so you can kind of see overall there's a pattern where you can see branches kind of coming off edges of cells like they're connecting to neighbors. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you might notice is intercalated discs. Intercalated discs are full of proteins, so they're going to be a bit more eosinophilic, and they're going to go across perpendicular to the uh, length of the cell. And so if you look carefully here on this particular image, you can kind of make out a few places where you have them. So here's an example of an inter intercalated disc. There's another one over here. There's another one over here. Again, uh, it depends on how well stained your slide is. Sometimes you will see them, sometimes you will not. Uh, but again, you're looking for very thin sort of lines that are kind of going perpendicular to the length of the cell. Okay, So you can see them here. I have on the next slide something a little bit more highly magnified. So this image here is magnified 1,000 fold. 
And so what you're seeing here is a nucleus. As soon as I can find my care. So here's the nucleus. And so around the nucleus, oh, that's a terrible outline. Okay. Around the nucleus in this region here, you can see there's a bit of a space. And down here as well. Space for other organelles. I'm going to draw the myofibrils in yellow maybe. So maybe I'll just use the highlighter in this case. And so the myofibrils are running on the length of this, so you can kind of see that they are separating here to allow space for that nucleus to be present. I'd also like you to notice that there are in fact striations visible here, so the striations are going across. So I'm going to highlight a few of them as soon as I can find my cursor. Here's a dark band, here's a dark band, here's a dark band, and so on. Now, you can see individual myofibrils here fairly easily, I think. You can see this kind of a thread like sort of material. Okay, and that's because in between them, again, where's my cursor? In this area, for example, here is where you would find the mitochondria. Now you can't really see the mitochondria in here very well. Uh, they are still quite small in terms of light microscopy. It would be very difficult to see, but they would be packed the way I've, I have just drawn in here, so that you have these long chains of mitochondria, and then in between them you're going to have these myofibrils. Okay, and just because you have so many of these mitochondria there, that's why the myofibrils can't be packed as tightly and as a result you don't see the striations as clearly at lower magnifications. Okay? The other features that I want to point out on this image uh, are the um, intercalated discs. So again they're visible here. I'll just try it in green. So here's one. You can kind of see this kind of a stepwise sort of appearance to it, very typical of um, intercalated discs. There's another one visible here. So basically that means that there's a branch point there somewhere and there are two cells that are connecting to one another. So there's another one. Here's another one of these visible. And there is another one over here. And down here at the edge. Kind of see if there's something up here as well. Okay, so um, again, if you have a well stained slide, you can see intercalated disc fairly clearly. Um, again, it's a bit of a mess of a slide in this case because it's very highly magnified. Uh, so the previous slide probably shows you a much more um, fair representation of what cardiac muscle would look like, at least in longitudinal section. Okay. Now, there's another cell type that you find within cardiac muscle, and that is a Purkinje fiber. Now, please um, be aware that it is referred to as a Purkinje fiber. Uh, there is a cell type called the Purkinje cell, and it is n has nothing to do with Purkinje fibers. Okay, so um, there's two different cell types named after Purkinje, and this one is referred to as a Purkinje fiber. So please do not call it a Purkinje cell. Okay. And now this is a modified muscle cell. Um, basically these are used to help coordinate muscle contraction um, and they kind of spread um, action potential, like, or I guess depolarizations um, to various parts of the cardiac muscle so that they all kind of get the same signal at the same time. So they are specialized to transmit uh, depolarization very quickly. Uh, they're not really contractile, okay? So they're modified muscle fibers. Um, they're very large, much larger than a typical cardiac muscle fiber. Um, again, you tend to find one to two central nuclei within the, this type of cell. Um, they are round. Um, there's also a very large empty space around the nucleus. So that perinuclear area that you saw uh, within the cardiac muscle fiber, this one will be much, much larger. Okay. 
Uh, and what we basically see is because these are non-contractile, we see some myofibrils, but they're only at the periphery. They're not really meant to uh, allow for a lot of contraction there. And so in this image that you're seeing, what you're seeing here is a cluster of these Purkinje fibers. So these guys here are very large cells. And what you can see is all of these cells have a nucleus and then a very large space around that nucleus. So you can clearly see the clear space around the nuclei. For comparison, here is a cardiac muscle cell, for example. So here roughly would be cardiac myocytes. Okay, so again, Purkinje fibers are much larger and you have a much larger clear space around that nucleus. Very, very obvious in this case. Okay. Let us move on to the last type of muscle, which is smooth muscle. And here we're dealing with uh, a type of muscle that we will be seeing for the rest of the semester. Uh, every system that we're going to be looking at is going to have quite a bit of smooth muscle in it. Uh, so you will become quite familiar with this one. So majority of the digestive tract is going to be lined by several layers of smooth muscle. Uh, blood vessels, you guys will be looking at those very soon. Um, also, will have quite a bit of smooth muscle in them. In fact, even in the skin, you're going to have small little uh, clusters of smooth muscle. Uh, this is a tissue that is not vascularized. The cells are very closely to associated with one another, so you have them actually connected to each other. They pull against one another, so when the muscle contracts, all the cells are pulling against each other. Uh, they do contain gap junctions, which allow them to coordinate their contractions. So the depolarization will travel from cell to cell through gap junctions, so they can all contract at the same time. Now, unlike the other muscles, these, uh, this type of muscle has a very good regenerative capacity. The cells here are mitotic, so they're able to regenerate the muscle when necessary. When there's damage, um, you can grow more smooth muscle if necessary. Okay. These are the least specialized type of smooth muscle, which is why they can actually do mitosis, whereas the other cell types do not. Uh, now, this type of muscle does have um, the ability to um, respond to innervation, but it also is able to respond to stretch. So when you stretch smooth muscle, it responds by contracting. Now, the cells themselves are smaller than what we've seen so far in terms of their thickness. Uh, they're also eosinophilic because they are filled with protein, but not quite as much as you saw within cardiac muscle or skeletal muscle. And those proteins are not arranged in the same way. So it's a very different arrangement of myofilaments. As you can see in the diagram, um, the arrangement is not going down the length of the cell, but it's kind of going from edge to edge to edge. Um, and when this cell contracts, it's actually an, an important th thing to keep in mind for the rest of the semester is when these cells contract, uh, they get shorter, but they also get thicker. Okay, so that's an that will be an interesting to keep in mind when you are looking at some of the organs uh, throughout the rest of the semester. Okay, and see how that affects their function. Now, in terms of the length, uh, the the shape uh, has a what is known as a fusiform shape, which basically means it's something like this. And you can kind of see this shape, uh, although incomplete. Um, in the image on the right hand side here. So I'm going to focus on this cell right here. You can see it's fairly long, but very, very thin, very skinny. Again, there'll be more to the cell beyond this uh, particular image. So it continues on. Um, and what you can see in here is this nucleus. So it's got an elongated central nucleus, but the nucleus, even though it's elongated, it's nowhere near the full length of the cell. And that's an important thing to keep in mind because when you look at this type of cell in cross-section, depending on when you cut this, when you section it here, you will not see a nucleus. When you section it here, you will not see a nucleus. Section it here, you will not see a nucleus. Section it here, you will see a nucleus. Section it here, you will not see a nucleus. Okay, so depending on how you cut this um, cell, uh, this particular cell, you either will see a nucleus or you will just see an eosinophilic sort of disc, right? And so again, what we're looking at in this image is just a uh, smooth muscle that has been teased apart. So someone sat down, took a piece of muscle, and just tried to pull the, the muscle fibers away from one another so you can see individual fibers. This is not what it's going to look like in a typical section. So what it actually looks like is something like this. OK? 
okay? And so you actually have two layers of smooth muscle here. You have the layer at the top, which is a longitudinal section, which is smooth muscle. And so you can see here, for example, we have nucleus, a muscle fiber, and again, that nucleus will be associated with a very long and skinny cell. And again, it's probably longer than this. Okay, and then we have near the bottom of this image a cross section through also smooth muscle. Okay, and so what you're seeing here is that you periodically see a nucleus but quite frequently you do not okay and so a lot of these little eosinophilic discs that you're seeing here are not really empty cells uh, these are cells that do have a nucleus it's just that the nucleus is not in the plane of section right now so all these cells here this is very typical of smooth muscle and cross section where it looks like we have a few nucleated cells and the rest of it is just eosinophilic discs. Okay, So that's a cross section through smooth muscle and longitudinal section above it. Alright, thanks for your time. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.